Good afternoon, everybody. It's 1 p.m. It's a Monday, and that can only mean one thing. But this is the final, the final live Business Horizon session um, on behalf of the UK Space Agency. My name is Jeremy Ambrose, Director of Entrepreneurial Spark, and we're in partnership with the University of Strathclyde delivering this Space Accelerator program. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We uh, have a really interesting topic coming up for you today. Um, that is all about horizon scanning, looking forward, um, thinking about what's coming up and how you can take advantage of it to help you overcome those barriers to growth of business. Um, before we do that, before we do that, I've got a quick plug um, because we have our hackathon or our sparkathon coming up. We're challenging barriers to business growth uh, in the space industry and it starts on Wednesday. So we only have a couple of spots left. So if you are interested in understanding or helping to uh, change the space industry to collaborate more, to break down intrinsic barriers to business growth and accelerate more opportunities for people and businesses both in and attracted to the space sector, then get involved. Get involved. Uh, you should see that um, in your in the browser that you have open right now on the web page, there's a big red button at the bottom. Please do sign up for it uh, and join us to really challenge those barriers. So that's um, that's starting on Wednesday, and the next session is on the 12th of May. But back to the present. Um, how to get involved right now. Uh, we have the Slido going on. We, we encourage you to get involved and ask questions of our expert panel that are coming on very shortly. Um, there, there, there are a couple of ways you can do this. First off, you can um, scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. Uh, there's a link again, just below on the left-hand side of your page, uh, or you can just go to slido.com and use the event code F733. Please do interact with us. Use um, use this time to ask questions uh, and to gain that little bit of extra knowledge about the um, about the sector that you're in or want to be in. Um, on your page as well, you should be see a little cog. Um, turn us up loud. Uh, turn us up bright. Use the HD settings, um, and uh, there are subtitles available to anybody who needs them or wants them. You are able to watch these again on the YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel. Um, but also, if you're learning something or if you pick something up uh, that you think might be useful for others, share it on our social pages, share it across um, the UK with the UK Space Agency, and just tell us what you picked up from these sessions. Anything that we don't answer on the Slido or any question that comes through there um, that we don't uh, get to, because we may, we may well be pushed for time, then um, we will answer them in a blog. We'll get those uh, answers to the technical questions that we may not be able to answer on the, on the, uh, on the session. And we shall publish that on our blog. So look out for that coming your way as well. The topic today is horizon scanning. As I said before, looking forward, understanding what's coming around the corner and how to take advantage of that. So there are some key outcomes that we want to get from this. Firstly, be able to question who you should be engaging with and working with in the space sector. Understand the need to be constantly looking forward because the need is real, you need to be looking forward. And be able to engage and exploit future markets and trends in the space sector. Coming up as well, we've got three fantastic uh, live guests. We've got, um, yeah, some real interesting characters on there who are going to lend in their expertise to uh, to help you overcome those barriers that um, that are in front of you right now. But before we get to those, let us just share some content with you. Um, let's get straight to the VT, the video, um, are all about horizon scanning in the space sector. All VT. The world is changing at a faster pace than ever, and nowhere is that more true than in the space sector. The challenge is keeping on top of the emerging trends whilst continuing to run your business day to day. If you don't do this, then you risk waking up in a year's time, finding that the world has moved on around you and you've got to rediscover your place. That's what horizon scanning is all about. So to help you with that today, we've gathered together some fantastic global expertise and packed them into this short recorded session. We've got UN team members joining us from Vienna, we've got leading private sector experts from PwC, senior public stakeholders through UK Space Agency and leading academic insight through the University of Strathclyde. We put them all to the test on the key emerging trends that are going to drive the space sector over the next five years or so to help you stay ahead of the curve and find opportunities for your business. So let's talk about horizon scanning. 
might seem hard to think about horizon scanning if you're early in your journey, but I think just looking to the future and you know looking at how your strategy as a company will evolve uh, will help you to innovate and stay ahead of your competition. A uh, competition, sorry, but it'll also help you in ad identify new opportunities that you might not have thought of before. And I think that is the value of the horizon scanning piece. Is if you look, if you look at your own organisation and say, where are we going to be in three, five, ten years' time? Uh, and what are the technologies that are going to be available in three, five years time and, and how do they or how can they help us? Uh, if you just like allow yourself to think like that, then I think you see a long, a lot, a lot of longer term opportunities crop up for your company as in rather than just focusing on the next six to 12 months. I mean, thinking about horizon scanning generally, what you're trying to do is anticipate things in the future, you know, expect the unexpected. Um, and actually trying to influence the future is one way that you can take a bit of control. Um, and also that you can, um, when you're talking to customers and so on, give that confidence because you're, you know, you're somebody who's really thought about this and, you know, what customers don't want and what you don't want as a business is something coming along that cuts your legs out from under you. Um, so really taking control of that thinking, I think, is, is really important. The main one, uh, the main ones are probably um, the emergence of uh, uh, digital transformation. This is a, it's a broad uh, uh, sort of a, sort of a broad term that encompasses multiple uh, evolutions and disruptions in the in the space sector, but this involves uh, basically the integration of uh, digital technologies into uh, the space sector into different parts of uh, of the space value chain, um, and these technologies include, for example, uh, cloud uh, storage and computing. Uh, to support uh, satellite service delivery, artificial intelligence and uh, automated analytics in order to support insight extraction from uh, uh, space data, uh, additive manufacturing, uh, for example, to support uh, uh, the, the upstream part of the space sector, and uh, uh, even uh, a blockchain, which is uh, um, being introduced or being considered in several use cases around uh, the space sector in, in multiple parts, either uh, in the management of the supply chain or even in the um, delivery of services uh, via SATCOM, for example. Yeah, so for me, I think the true value of Earth observation data has, is still to be realized. I think, and I think that will come through in the next uh, five to 10 years. Because uh, I, I think right now, everyday businesses don't really fully grasp what's possible with uh, Earth observation data. And it it's kind of feels like this sort of thing that's there, but they don't really know what to do with it. And I think that will change in the next five to 10 years. And I think it's from a combination of new services that are coming online. So for example, the company ISI who have developed synthetic aperture radar satellites, uh, you know, they've miniaturized the, te miniaturized the technology so that they can put thousands up there and they're actually able to deliver you a nice synthetic aperture radar image every single day. Uh, so that's like something that is like a complete step change in the industry and will enable like a whole uh, a whole range of new opportunities. I work for the UN Office for Open Space Affairs uh, based here in Vienna, Austria, and we are the, the UN entity, the, the sole UN entity dedicated to space and working across the legal, policy, technical and, and scientific aspects of supporting international cooperation um, in space activities. Uh, we've opened up a whole range of opportunities for, for uh, individuals from, as I say, non or emerging space variant nations to actually do things which they wouldn't be able to do currently within their own context. Um, and we have a series of partners, I think we've got four online already, where the point in the established spacefaring entity in that triangle is actually a private company. And so that's the UN working with a, a commercial space entity to open up part of their activities, part of their operations, or something that they've got in their particular um, ballpark or locker to an emerging space variation. So it's an incredible example of, uh, of uh, corporate engagement, corporate support for bringing the benefits of space uh, to everyone, everywhere, which is the the, um, the vision statement for the UN Office of Aerospace.
space. Space, even if we, we right now we, uh, we see a trend to characterize space as increasingly commercial, in the end we need to remember that space is uh, uh, still driven a lot by institutional demand and uh, as such it is also driven by public policies at the broader level. What, what does it mean? It means that if you have a specific policies pushing, for example, for sustainability and a green transition, um, these policies are going to affect uh, space in a way, creating opportunities. Because there's now more and more opportunities to uh, develop specific space technologies that can support the green transition of other sectors or that can support uh, um, sustainable uh, operations of other sectors. Quantum technology and connectivity through the likes of 5G are also ones to watch. Uh, space is like quickly becoming one of the most effective ways to stay connected to the far reaches of our planet. So if you're talking about you know cars, boats, planes, or even areas that haven't had internet to this to this day. You know, so certain areas of Africa have basically not had any access to internet. Space technology will allow those areas to be connected to the internet, and that itself will just like open up mass a massive amount of opportunity and you know quantum can be used to help secure those connections uh, but I think the, the the sort of opportunities within quantum go beyond just security and we're yet to see what exactly what those are going to be uh, and then 5G technology obviously kind of ensures that the, the speeds are what we would expect from our, our sort of current internet connections. Now I think the other thing is the space sector has to take advantage of some of the um, you know, in terms of some of the local clusters we're trying, trying to create, um, to take advantage of rooting themselves in the communities in which they're placed. You know, there will be um, uh, people who are perhaps part of one type of industry that's shutting down, that have got skills that are really relevant to companies that are trying to start up using, using space. Um, you know, people will be close to universities, which themselves are kind of powerhouses of diversity, innovative thinking and so on. Um, you know, you're always, wherever you are, next to other businesses, um, networking with them and making sure you understand, you know, where they're going and whether you can draw on that um, is a real opportunity. So again, it's part of this sort of open, um, inclusive mindset that I think will lead to businesses which can be successful and which can spot the next opportunities. It's likely that private sector and industry aren't as aware of the intergovernmental work as they could be, but there's a lot of interesting developments or important developments that come out of that, um, including a recent development related to space sustainability. Space sustainability is, is, is something that's really crucial. We want to make sure that in the old days, the, the, the kit, not in the old days, it's still now, sorry, I, I'm thinking as if I'm in the future, uh, but the kit that goes up, it's expensive to make and often it, it, you know, it's going to be left there or it's going to break, be broken up in orbit. That can cause problems because it, it will become debris. Uh, so we need to make sure that we are working, a lot of my work is in, in, uh, in standardization, making sure we've got the right high standards to be able to say, if you're going to go up and you're finishing with your kits, then you either need to get it safely away out, out of the orbit uh, and it's not going to come back or you bring it down safely uh, to burn up through the atmosphere uh, and and then that brings into question that, that kind of reusability this stuff costs a lot of money to make uh, and to manufacture and to engineer and to design and and to put it up in space it'd be great to, be able to get it back down and reuse it again uh, or if it's in in orbit uh, can we can we can we refuel it can we get it carrying on running can we augment it? Uh, are we looking to, to the future where we're starting to think, okay, can we reuse some of the, the debris that's out there? Can we reuse parts? Can we manufacture in space? Can we 3D print in space? Can we start to make craft from space that we don't have to lift off the ground uh, and, and get into space? Uh, can we start to use uh, you know, some of those that kind of having that stress on, on interoperability across international, uh, the international landscape, can we start to work with each other uh, and not go belting off down one avenue when we could all be working together and go, actually, you know, rather than let's have a, a, a Betamax versus VHS for the older guys amongst us who remember that kind of debate. Uh, it, you know, we, we've got the kind of rules of the road, we've got the codes of conduct and, and we know we can all work together. So that's quite exciting. I think there is a 
a very marked interest of industry and the private sector to show themselves as good space actors, to engage in corporate responsibility and social responsibility and tools such as the guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, uh, while not politic or while not legally binding, they do have a lot of political weight, and they they can help guide business in the right direction. So we've heard there about some of the key trends and disruptive influences that are on the horizon in the space sector. The thing that stands out to me is something that Catherine Mealing Jones from UK Space Agency said: "Influencing is one way that you can take control." So horizon scanning isn't just about sitting back, looking at what's out there and waiting for it to happen to you, but about finding the areas that you can get involved and shape. It's not just about avoiding bumps in the road, but finding the right canoe, jumping in, grabbing a paddle, working out who's paddling in the same direction and how you can all get there together. You have the capability and the choice to decide whether to grab that paddle or whether to be a passenger in the canoe. So my challenge to you is, how much time do you spend horizon scanning? How often in a week do you indulge your curiosity and just look beyond the boundaries of what you already know? I hope after this you'll put some time aside to look at the key trends that could shape your business and what your role could be in creating the future. Thank you so much. Wow, what a what a uh, well an insightful VC for sure. Um, please do get your questions coming in right now. We've got the Slido open. Um, you just saw the link on the screen just then. Um, get involved. Get involved. If there's anything in you're unclear of uh, to help you navigate the space sector or horizon scanning, then and get those questions in and get those questions into our three live guests this afternoon. Um, uh, we're we're kind of indulging in live guests because we normally have an entrepreneur, but uh, this time we're going to have three live live um, expert panelists. So. Um, I, I want to bring those guys in and start the conversation. Let's get straight into it because um, we have uh, Ian Freeman, uh, who you saw on the VT. He's the assistant, assistant program officer at the United Nations uh, Office for Outer Space Affairs, uh, you know, you know, sir. Um, Ian, if I could bring you in again, just, just tell us exactly what you do. What does that title mean? And the old, the old classic, you are on mute, Ian. <laughs> yeah. That uh, title, um, I mean, the title UN Officer of Space Affairs, I think most people start thinking about aliens and they do wonder, you know, what the UN is even doing no. in space. Um, but you'll be, you'll be glad to hear that the UN does put most of its resources into um, humanitarian issues and fighting <laughs> global poverty. Um, but, but since the launch of, of Sputnik, actually, there has been this, this small office and the pronunciation of the acronym is perfect, UNUSA. Um, and, and what we do is we bring together national governments and uh, support the policy making process at, at the UN level. And as we all know, uh, in the space sector, space is inherently international. There really isn't any uh, uh, borders up there. And so cooperation between uh, different stakeholders is, is fundamental. Wow. That used to be a government-to-government -government conversation. It still is a government-to-government-led conversation, but increasingly the private sector are getting involved, which is fantastic because we really need, do need to make sure what we do here at the UN remains fit for purpose for what's happening out there in the real world. Yeah. Um, very great. And my job is just uh, doing external relations, so I'm connecting the United Nations with the global space sector, so making sure that that partnership and those relationships is firing on all cylinders. Super. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, the second person I want to bring in is Dr. Luigi Scatia. He's a, um, uh, he's, he works for PwC, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, and he's a partner, um, but his, his interest is in very much, the, he's, he's the space practice leader. Luigi, please say hi. And um, what, do you, what does it mean by a space practice leader? Thank you so much, Jeremy, and thanks a lot for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, well, indeed, uh, I've been uh, actually working in the space sector for my entire career. I started more on the technical side before uh, doing an MBA and joining a, a strategy consulting firm, which was Booz & Company at the time, and then Booz was acquired by PwC. So um, we are basically an expert team 
uh, that deals with strategy and policy consulting uh, exclusively for the space sector. So we are based out of France, but we serve the, the uh, let's say, the PwC network worldwide. So we have uh, a point of contacts and satellite uh, teams in other regions. And we deliver a range of uh, advisory services that go from pure strategy, even uh, like a lot that has to do with entrepreneurship uh, uh, and, uh, you know, also support uh, to scale up and so on. And uh, um, also more policy oriented uh, type of studies, like looking at uh, countrywide uh, uh, strategies and, uh, and governance and so on. And we also do uh, actually uh, some uh, work in the utilization of space data, because we have a technical team that does uh, satellite image, uh, images uh, processing, uh, advanced data fusion and so on. So we try to bring the use space also within you know, the, the boundaries of PwC to support uh, other uh, sectors. Super. So we try to bridge this gap when, uh, uh, you know, when the technology push doesn't meet the, the, the demand. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to have you on the panel. And uh, yeah, we're coming to you uh, very shortly as well. So the final, um, the final person is Kathy Bowden. Um, Kathy, there hi. she there you are, Kathy. <laughs> hi. Um, yeah, j just tell us. National Space Skills and Careers Point of Contact for the UK Space Agency. Skills are going to be really, uh, you know, they're going to be, we're going to need more diverse skills. We're going to need different but traditional skills being transferred. Tell us a bit about what you do and how you do it. Okay, so um, thanks for inviting me. It's really, it's, it's a huge, broad um, church, I think is the best way to describe it, or environment. Luigi's already uh, alluded to it. I work closely with people across the sector from, you know, from companies who are launching a pieces of kit into space to companies who are using the data and analyzing it um, here on Earth for all sorts of end purposes. So understanding the skills that they need and what they're trying to do, looking to the future, particularly as they, as they think about that. I'm working with industry across the piece but also with academia who have many problems too and uh, and across government so very very broad mm -hmm. um and it's it is you we've done some work on um, gathering the evidence we issued a issued a survey last year and indeed published it early this year to look at the skills issues that are relevant across the sector mm -hmm. and that is providing evidence that will take us take us forward from here it it's yes. very very wide <laughs> yeah absolutely and if if i just stay with you a second kathy because we saw that in the um in, in the vt we we had um i can't remember who it was but so, uh, it, i think it was Catherine Mina jones talking about um you know those traditional skills and and from industries that may be suffering or, or failing um how do you actually understand how do you actually understand your your place in the space sector if you have those if the skills that are on that report for instance how do i get involved well i think one of the things to remember is that the skills that you develop whatever career you've taken whichever sector you've gone into the skills that you develop as your career progresses progresses are hugely transferable to everybody you know whether or not you're get, uh, learning how to project manage better, how your um, your your business development skills. You know, it's that intersectionality of business with entrepreneurial, with technical, uh, with with social and people skills, mm -hmm. hugely important. And we know that as we develop from base level up, people um, who who develop those those great skills they leave our sector to go to other sectors what we need to do is make sure that people feel welcome coming back in the opposite direction and yeah. i think that you know that's the that's the key thing for me is is yes it's here come and talk and then we'll give you some ideas about the direction of travel yeah absolutely and those conversations are open and please do come and have those conversations absolutely yeah um it was interesting to hear i mean i i wrote down one two three four five six seven there's about 10 different um, trends, emerging markets in there. 
Um, and then there was a big focus on green and sustainability. Ian, if I could come to you. Um, now, there is an agreement that's just been signed between, is it 95 countries? Yeah. Just tell us a bit about this. Um, so the, this is the long-term sustainability guidelines. So that's an agreement, as you say, signed and, and, uh, and negotiated between 95 national governments. Yeah. Actually, it went up to the General Assembly last year, so it's been received consent from all 193 uh, countries. Oh, okay. um, and in a nutshell, it's a green agenda, but it's a green agenda for the space environment. Um, so, I mean, just following up on from what Luigi and Cathy just said, it, I think it is really important that we start as quickly as possible to compartmentalize the concept of space. Because if you're talking about operations in space, it's very, very different from, from a commercial operation using data and services from space. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you can just label it as a space activity, but as soon as you've made that fork in the road, you open up a whole different range of, uh, of options and, and, uh, and concepts, really. And, and as you're referring to, this agreement is really talking about environmentalism, but in the space environment. So a little bit like the Paris Accords, but for, for the space itself. Um, in a nutshell, it's 21 guidelines that the world's agreed describe what responsible and sustainable behavior looks like for generations to come. Uh, and it digs down into a whole bunch of details about how we can adjust our space operations today to make sure that, that 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years down the line, the space environment's still there, still accessible, uh, and being used in, a, in, as I say, a responsible and sustainable manner um, in the interests of everybody. And uh, yeah, it was a real landmark agreement at the UN level, but obviously now we've got to get on with implementing it. So that's what we're really focusing on yeah. uh, at the moment. And if I'm if I'm sat there as a small business or somebody who's looking to get into the sector, how can I use that agreement to my benefit, or how how can I maybe adhere to some of those things to 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 prove myself that I am a sustainable? I'm I'm here. I'm here to play for a long time. How how can I do that? It's a really good question. Um, I think I would go back to some of the comments in the content where that that relationship with national governments is mm. is really key, because if your government signed up to it. And, and everybody's government has, then it shows that they're committed uh, and it shows that they'll be looking to, to support implementation. So, uh, I mean, it's a huge range of policy that's been covered. So I could just pick one topic, space debris, space debris um, mitigation and mediation. So a lot of that is obviously about propulsion. So once your satellites reach the end of its life cycle, it needs to, if it's in lower Earth orbit, deorbit uh, and get itself out of the way for future satellites. Mm. That requires uh, a certain type of management approach. That obviously requires uh, a certain type of propulsion. I mean, providing uh, solutions, providing ideas, providing products that would make other people's operations more sustainable mm. in a way that, that doesn't have too much of a significant economic burden um, would be a fantastic response to these policy developments at the international level. And, and that's just one example of, of many. They're, the devil really is in the details on these types of things. Definitely. And I guess, uh, you know, at the heart of the problem, there is a, well, there is a problem, um, which is around the space debris. But, you know, if you kind of look at the onion layers of support and, and people who are trying to solve that, it's going to take so many different industries and so many sectors to actually make sure that debris is controlled. And that kind of comes into the commercialization angle. There's so many areas that we can look at. Luigi, you're, I guess you're looking at the commercialization in space, but also from the VT, you talked about uh, digital transformation. And there are so many different sectors that are getting involved within the space sector now. Um, just tell us how, how some of those are getting involved. Well, I guess the, the, um, indeed this is a, it's a key trend that we see right now in the, in the space sector. So there is a push towards the digitalization at different levels. Mm. So really um, it's really broad and it's all across the value for the space so on the manufacturing side I mean you see uh, companies at all level uh, organizing their uh, their production in a way that is more uh, that is actually streamlined thanks to digital uh, technologies uh, so this is true of the big uh, manufacturers that are actually operating what we call the digital transformation mm. so they're we need a number of technologies in order to uh, uh, monitor and uh, 
uh, use uh, actively the data that, uh, that is produced during the manufacturing in order to improve uh, quality, in order to, uh, to reduce uh, cost and human intervention in a sector that is uh, that still less quite a lot of human intervention in manufacturing because of course space while uh, some things are becoming more serial in production is still quite uh, quite about like uh, relatively uh, low series uh, or unique pieces and then uh, we also see it in the service delivery in the downstream where it is all about data and so it's all about how you handle and manage this data and how you fuse it with other sources of data in order to extract valuable insights. And so in this particular space, I mean, this particular area, excuse the, the pun, I mean, you can see the broad interest of large data companies. Sure. Uh, I mean, not only cloud providers like, uh, of course, AWS or uh, Microsoft with Azure Space and so on, but also um, large, uh, professional services companies like SAP, for example, to uh, get into the integration of space data, uh, grabbing like as much as possible of, uh, uh, of the huge plethora of space data that is being produced. Because in the end, it's, uh, it's I mean, it's, it's going to be like a super valuable source of uh, valuable insights. Yeah. I guess it's a, it's really like a broad uh, thing, but if I had to say, I would say that these are the two main uh, main areas uh, mm -hmm. uh, where we see the digital converging into space. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think it was last, last, the, the last business horizon session, we, we, we looked at the differentiation between kind of upstream and downstream. And it, it seems the more and more companies are able to access the upstream through the downstream. Um, so all of that kind of digital transformation within existing sectors, um, understanding their place uh, in, in, in the space sector as well. There's, there's a number of listen there's a number of different aspects to being able to work more globally with organizations large organizations small organizations and them coming together that um i guess the the globalization and partnerships angle all three of you are from very large organizations but if i'm on the other side of the table and i'm a small organization how could i really understand how to have a conversation with you about what's going forward. Are there forums, are there places where I can just, you know, drop in, drop out and have a conversation? Who wants to go? <laughs> I can start if you want. Yeah, uh, go for it. I think the good thing about space, uh, if you want, is that um, it's a small sector with huge implications. And the small sector part means that, you know, there is a, there is a close knit community that it's generally easily reachable through a number of major events and conferences worldwide and fora and, uh, and, and webinars and so on. So, and apologies, there's some white noise. <laughs> so I guess it's quite easy to get into the, into a conversation, uh, with the space community if you want to. Yeah. Maybe I'll let the others <laughs> talk a little bit. I, I guess I could also put, put in. So um, I started off in um, with a major multinational um, minerals exploration company where we were using Earth observation data for, our, um, to, for exploration. And, and then took that into a company that subsequently is now part of, part of Airbus. But in the process, I worked with small companies, I worked with large companies, collaboration is the key. I then went into academia, again, collaborating with large companies, with small companies, with government. And now I'm within government working with, guess what, small, large and everything else. And I think one of the most important things as you go through these various iterations is understanding the different you know, you almost need that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Babelfish, to enable you to translate what you're talking about from the language that you're using with this client to the language that you need to use with that client, yeah. whatever they may be. And, and that adaptability and agility is increasingly important, particularly as we see the developments that Luigi was describing earlier, um, and, and with with more and more things coming on stream and particularly with horizon scanning. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think you picked up on a really good point as well. That's kind of a thread throughout to here, and that is that entrepreneurial skills are going to be really needed to help you transition between those conversations, let alone transition between a small business and a large business. It's yeah, it's it's huge. Just having the right conversation at the right time, but having it in a structured way that people get a, get the most out of it. Yeah. Ian, anything to add? Um, well, in terms of forums, uh, the the UN we host an annual forum called the UN World Space Forum in the in the autumn, so November time, and that's a real it's a public event. Most of our events are public, and and everyone's encouraged to to attend and sign up. And there's a lot of interaction there. Obviously, being the UN, it's intrinsically uh, international in scope. I think the other thing from from the UN's point of view is that we have the the big global uh, sustainable agendas, so the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and, and the Sendai uh, Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And, I mean, all governments are interested in implementing them. And downstream space services and space data is huge. It really is huge. Uh, we did research with the European Space Agency a couple of years ago on the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals looking at all facets of public policy from agriculture to poverty reduction, water management, et cetera. And 40% of the indicators in terms of, you know, the things that people have to measure to quantify how good they're doing um, in terms of implementation, 40% require either earth observation or geolocation data to, to report accurately. So I think that's quite a tangible illustration of what, what everyone's talking about today in that You'd, if you're not thinking upstream, if you're thinking downstream, you do have to, I mean, you've probably got an advantage there thinking, well, what can my service do outside of the space sector? So how can I link in with agriculture, as you said, or water management, et cetera, and make what I'm trying to do as useful as possible? Um, yeah. and, and really the scope is, is huge. So lots of options in that direction. Who's, who's really driving this? Is it, is it the public? Is it the private sector? Um, you know, in, in terms of driving towards the future and who's out there really horizon scanning and setting the future for us, public, private, who do you think it is? All right. I think, I, I, I think so. I can stop. I mean, uh, so what I, um, what I can echo, I mean, I echo what I said before. I mean, I think we hear a lot about commercial space and, mm. um, it's it's really true that there are a lot of commercial actors and the way of actually doing uh, um, you know development in space and investment in space has probably changed but i think we should uh, always consider that uh, uh, a large part of the demand is still driven by uh, by uh, governments mm. uh, so i guess that the fundamental transition was more that before space was also a little bit more government led you know, even uh, major developments and, uh, and execution of, uh, of activities were government led, while right now uh, governments are more uh, on the procurement side. So they just uh, uh, drive the demand, but still, I think government demand uh, plays uh, still a big role. Uh, it's not to say that it's, uh, that it's only government demand, of course, because there's a lot of commercial demand uh, in many, many ways. And, uh, from uh, an increasing number of, uh, um, you know, verticals uh, downstream, this is for sure. But uh, in many in many situations, um, government still plays a big big yeah. role. Even for example, in Earth observation, you know, with all the um, major developments in the utilization of satellite data in other sectors, and so on, uh, still government and defense are uh, represent right now the bulk of the demand for uh, uh, for imaging yeah. data. There's, there's a few nods there, Ian, Kathy. Are you are you in agreement there? Are you are you thinking differently? Yeah, I think I, I would agree that you you know there is no doubt that governments as the, the anchor customer, if you like, um, needs to kick kick the ball rolling quite often. Yeah. But I think we've also seen an acceleration um, over over the last ten years, and I would say it's you know it's exponential now. It's it's logarithmic. Um, we've we, we're going to see huge changes in the next 10 years. And I think we're also seeing changes in the business models that call for, you know, how you pay for data. 
you know, gone are the days where, okay, you know, when in my previous life, I wanted to buy a satellite image of, um, of Brazil. Okay, I could go and buy it, it free open skies, great, yes, I got it, but I, I bought the whole scene, end of, uh, and then did what I wanted to do with it. Now, you know, there are a far more innovative ideas about how you buy the data, the package of data that you get and how you can how you can use that or indeed whether the company and the satellite have done the sorting of the data before it even comes down so yeah. there's a lot of change there and i think that you know that ability to be able to buy what you want and get it is going to change things quite a lot yeah. um you know, so I guess, does that, does that, do you see the shift is there a shift from um kind of the public to private uh, and you know looking forward kind of next five to ten years do you think that's going to be accelerated to more kind of private influence than public i think i think it depends on what what part of the sector you're looking at um because there's different there's there's different levels of, of maturation um so to speak and i mean in terms of shift from public to private, if, as you go lower down, not lower down, but as, as you go more into the downstream sector, and perhaps as you start thinking about more niche products in terms of using data, then you're quite absorb, uh, you're quite distant from some of the decisions which the governments are making. That doesn't mean that you're beyond impact, because that's obviously mm. the same for a lot of sectors with regards to the relationship between regulation um, and uh, and on the ground activities, but. There's huge parts of the space sector which are now really, really, really mature. So, so other than a, a Kessler syndrome situation or something happening up there, which uh, you didn't realise that was uh, connect, you're connected to, you, you know, you off you go. Like really, as a private sector entity, the, the world's your oyster. Then, when you kind of get higher up um, into the upstream market, then just as colleagues have just said now. Um, it's going to be public sector five, you know, launch services, uh, exploration, um, in orbit servicing, right. uh, space debris mitigation, space debris mediation, all of those things, private space, private space flight, five, 10, 15, 20, 25 is still going to be uh, a public sector driven thing. Just yeah. one quick point from my side. I mean, it is important to think internationally. It's important to think of the countries that you're working with here. Obviously, at the UN working with everybody. Um, UK is doing a great job, if I must say so, of promoting commercial space. Um, there's a couple of other, you know, leaders out there, like Luxembourg, Singapore, UAE come to mind. Um, but then there are other countries which look at space almost entirely from a defence point of view, and that's where their space sector is growing. And so obviously that's a very different set of stakeholders. And that yeah. really, if you are thinking internationally in your in your commercial ventures, you need to factor in in terms of who you're talking to and, and how you talk to them. And that's a really and interesting you know, There's, there's going to be competition. Yeah, Luigi, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add one point, you know, on uh, what uh, Ian said. I mean, I just wanted to clarify that in the end, even in the upstream, you know, you did have a shift from public to private in the way, uh, you know, the, the, the business is created and the assets are developed and so on. So there was a substantial and paradigm uh, shift move over there as well. Huh? So even yeah. if the demand stays public, before you had mainly like a, a government driven development contracts that were like cost plus contracts, zero risk for the industry and so on, developing the, like large assets like I don't know, launchers or uh, even satellite programs and so on. What you have right now is basically the government acting indeed, as uh, Katie has said, as a, as a customer, as an anchor customer, mm -hmm. uh, but the public, uh, the private sector uh, actually driving the development and bearing the risk, basically. And this has, uh, has still uh, been uh, a transformative uh, shift huh? because in the end, I mean, you see right now, uh, I don't know, launcher, launch vehicle programs, developing launchers with a fraction of the cost that costed before with, uh, with you know, uh, cost plus uh, government contracts. You yeah. see like a lot of initiative from the private sector that then maybe it finds, uh, it answers to a demand from governments, but still, I mean, it's private initiative. It's still a, a massive shift from public to private in the way uh, the sector operates. And, and then it's normal that, uh, as, as Ian said, I mean, it's normal that a certain part of the demand is institutional. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and I think you know that the, there's a there's a key point in there, isn't it? Isn't there? You know, that, but where, whereas before it was very kind of policy led um, and public organisation, there seems to be a force of innovation driving the big guys uh, and, and driving that policy now. Because as you said, you know, miniaturisation um, and, and 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 people working together at the at the, at the small end, they're going to if, if people more, more people coming together is going to actually influence the big boys. So it kind of feels like there's going to be more of a private influence, especially from the from the SMEs and entrepreneurs and innovation that's going mm-hmm. to maybe drive the public policies that come out. Yeah. And I can I see think, a few more there. Go on, Kathy. Well, I was just going to say, I think there's also a huge place for engaging with with academia and research and making sure that you're joining the dots, dots there mm-hmm. as well. Not only in developing higher level skills, which, of course, is hugely important, but it's also that cutting edge development and innovation, which which we all need. And yeah. that will that will fuel things further. I mean, some of it will be low TRL. Some of it will be high TRL. But we've got to look at that whole pipeline, not only in people, but in technology and think about how we're going to support it and ensure that we're developing the capabilities that we need for the future. And that's where the horizon scanning and strategies come come to the fore. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's um, there's, there's a couple of questions coming in from the Slido, which I, I, I would like to kind of quickly move to. Um, one of them being that the space sector is facing uh, testing capability. Sorry, what space sector facing testing capabilities are currently missing from the UK supply chain that will be needed now or in the next five years? That's that kind of horizon scanning. So can anybody talk talk to that point at all? Testing capabilities? Yeah, so what space sector facing testing capabilities are currently missing from the UK supply mm. chain that will be needed over that will be needed now or in the next five mm. years? That might be too technical mm. to uh, probably, get into the detail. Yeah, of it. I'm probably not in the best position to answer. No, I, but if it links, I don't know exactly the full. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it could link to the TRL and what you were talking about there, Kathy, in terms of, you know, um, that, you know, the, the skills that we're going to need to, to link back into um, the testing capabilities. Um, how, d- what sectors out there are going to be kind of drawn into the space sector to 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 to, to increase testing capabilities? Certainly from what I've seen, um, and this is a complex question because it fits into yeah. everything, yeah. Um, I'm seeing increasing increasing interest in particularly radiation testing and, and how that's done. Um, and then materials, different materials, new materials, lighter materials. Yeah. Um, all of that will, will add to that capability as we go forward. And um, I, think, I think that's... You know, it is around high value manufacturing, developing those um, cap- those the understanding of that technology further and taking it to the next level, understanding how it operates in micro G and uh, um, with high radiation has got to be important if your what you're developing is going into space. Mm-hmm. Of course, testing in other senses has got to include the fact that you're building in security, particularly cyber security from from day one with whatever it is you're building. Right. Secure by design is absolutely imperative. Yeah, yeah, definitely. From my, from my old days as a, as, a, as a research scientist, maybe in the UK, uh, but I mean, the UK is pretty well uh, equipped, uh, I mean, on, uh, all across the, the supply chain of space, uh, so from, uh, from the upstream to the downstream in, in many different ways. Maybe one thing that it's not there yet, but there aren't programs specifically in that, is testing for re-entry technologies. Mm. I don't know if you can confirm, like very high temperature um, testing of materials and structures. I don't know. Uh, if that's the case, but at the same time, there isn't at the moment uh, a huge emphasis on uh, on on these. Uh, no. The global yeah. so maybe 
Yeah, and that links that sustainability angle, isn't it? You know, what goes what goes up must come down. Um, uh, and being able to test those um, test the levels of yes, radiation as we're talking about there, but um, being having the ability to test things going up that are coming down is is really important. Um, how do we build a skills pool now to deliver for the industry? That's kind of in ten years' time, Kathy. This is you know what. As I'm as I'm sat here thinking, how can I see myself in the space industry? What skills are going to be required, and how do we build that pool? I guess where do we start? Um, you know, when you think about the pipeline, it's it's a typical you know it's a fairly typical STEM pipeline. We've yeah. got to make sure that we're encouraging the kids right at the bottom. You know, from the stuff that um, primary schools were doing with Principia and and Tim Peake's launch all the way through we must make sure we don't lo lose too many um, as they make the transition from GCSEs to to A levels and then we've got to make sure that they're encouraged into the right kind of degrees uh, as they go into university but we're also looking more and more at the um, the vocational side of things so so new standards in space engineering um, for space engineering technicians new degree apprenticeship in that area. But don't forget, of course, the artificial intelligence and the, the applicability of those skills that are very much for, for our sector as well. How many companies are already thinking ahead to, to seeing how they can develop those skills internally through an apprenticeship route? Really good way of grabbing and holding people and keeping them within your business mm -hmm. particularly when you think of a high value skill like that where most companies that i look at i talk to in in space take one look at the a typical artificial intelligence specialist salary and go oh, we're never going to be able to afford it you know if you can home grow it maybe that gives you a a half, a half chance of keeping those people going with you but it's yeah. also about thinking about the in career continuing professional development bringing bringing people in and giving them the what i sort of call the space veneer so those people we talked about right at the beginning who are in parallel sectors with having done the right you know they've been on the right trajectory want to come into the space sector what do we give them to give them the understanding of the space to domain knowledge that they need. And um, there, there's possibilities for that. We can do it. We just need to make sure we can aggregate the need. Um, and then, of course, to develop those highly specialist skills. We've been, we've been in a bit of a hiatus with um, the, 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 with GNSS going with the EU. Um, we need to develop those skills. We need to give people who have those skills a clear idea of where their career um, development will go if they stick with those skills. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of aspects along, along that chain that we need to, to be thinking about. And let's not forget that we need to ensure that with those technical people coming in, not everybody wants to stay as a technical specialist. What can we give them to give them the business skills that they need to be able to develop those markets that are going to be in the future just as important? So it's a, you know, you tell me which bit you're interested in and I'll find you a direction to go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just the point, isn't it? There's just so much there. Um, and it's emerging, it's changing, it's, 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 it's being shaped by innovation, it's being shaped, you know, there's so much going on. I mean, Jerry, could I, could I just add to the list? Sorry, before you, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Kathy's got a huge one there. I mean, you've also got space lawyers. Um, you've also got space finance. Uh, again, as, as the sector matures, we're seeing an explosion of think tanks, so policy experts. This obviously goes into a different side of the academic world, um, but br bridging that research that's going on in academia um, and bring it back to public policy making. These are, you know, quote unquote, soft skills, certainly not um, STEM skills. But if you're actually trying to draw a circle around your, your national space economy, uh, you, you, you're perfectly within your rights, at least speaking personally, to include those people in that figure. And then obviously there's an economic return and, uh, and a commercial gain to be made. I mean, just one very quick point, going back to the space sustainability element, in that the world's agreed on what sustainability looks like in practice. 
but we've not agreed how to measure what sustainability looks like in reality. Um, so there is now growing research going into that to try and create metrics, create indicators on space sustainability. But that really is, in terms of horizon scanning, not there yet. Um, and, and so obviously that's a long way from STEM per se, uh, but it's another kind of broader way of looking at what we're talking about. Yeah, okay. And I think we've, uh, yeah, so we've bombarded everybody with a whole load of information there. So let's kind of narrow it down. And if I could just go around and if I could just get that one key tip, you know, one key tip from each of you to um, drive somebody's horizon scanning, what would it be? Who wants to go first? I, 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 okay, I'll tell you what, I'll go first. I'll go first. I'll give you, I'll give you a steer. Um, for me, it's about holding conversations. So I would just say, have as many conversations as you can with people in the industry and surrounding the industry to under, understand it a little bit more, to understand your place in it and what your next move will be. Conversations. Yeah. I'll go, I'll I'll go, go next. Go, uh, okay. Oops, sorry, please. Oh, go on. <laughs> Catherine, okay, go on. I'll, I'll build on your, your conversations. Um, conversations networks. And don't think that just because you graduated from university last year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that your learning is over. It is not. We yeah. are all learning every single day. Absolutely. Yeah, I like that one. Ian, go on. I, I think, yeah, I'll build on for you as well. You know, in those conversations, just understanding what people care about um, and, know, and knowing your industry, knowing your niche. Um, and knowing who ultimately you're having to convince that you can add value through whatever you're trying to do. Yeah, it comes down to that whole, uh, and it's a really kind of direct question, but who are you and who cares? <laughs> it's a very direct question, but if you keep on asking yourself that, then yeah, you'll, you'll find out. You'll find out. Luigi, go on, a, a one-liner. For me, I think the, the, the tip would be to try to go, um, I know it's not easy, but to try to go with a top-down perspective and understand the macro dynamics of the sector and then narrow it down to the specific, um, let's say segment you're interested in. But I think space is one of those few sectors where you can't um, avoid the, the, the bigger picture if you want to understand your little, uh, you know, your specialized, your very specialized uh, piece. Uh, because of the way it is, uh, because of the way it works, and uh, the way it is all interconnected with broader uh, aspects. So I would say uh, to look at, even if not easy, to look at the big picture first. Thank you. That that's it. Thank you so much for for, for being part of this um, and adding your thoughts into as as an expert panel member. I really appreciate it. Some really good conversation topics there, and we could go on forever. But thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I do want to come to uh, the point where we close this and just let you know what's coming up as well, because we have our last Action Connection session on Thursday. So you can join that um, via the QR code there. There's also a link just below on the web browser. Uh, that's on Thursday the 29th between 12 and 1.30 p.m. There's a Slido poll. So those of you who have been interacting with us on the Slido, please do take that poll and let us have some feedback on it, um, on this whole session. That would be great. Hitting those key outcomes, I hope you've now got the question to ask yourself about how to engage and who to engage with in the space sector um, and to be able to engage and exploit future markets and trends within, uh, within the space sector too. A quick reminder, there's a big red button at the bottom of your page to get involved with the, um, with the Sparkathon, which is our hack event coming up, first one on Wednesday, to really, uh, really challenge that challenge. Um, which you can read on there, but we're really challenging those barriers to business growth in the industry. Um, have your say in that conversation. But overall, I just think it leaves me to say thank you so much for joining us. If you've been part of any of the other sessions, thank you so much. This is the eighth and final session that we are running, um, but you can continue the conversation. Please do join our Discord channel. Um, build relationships, ask questions, and just help yourself to overcome the barriers that are in front of you in business and, and, and beyond. So thank you so much for being part of these sessions. Take care.